Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome again to Tokyo on Fire. Today is May 21st, 2015. This is our 13th episode, and today's burning issue is opposition parties in Japan. What role do they play in the political dynamic? What differentiates them among themselves? And also, what differentiates them against the ruling coalition, which is comprised of the Liberal Democratic Party and Komeito? Today, I'm joined with guests Michael Chuchek and Dr. Nancy Snow. Before we hit our burning issue today, I'd like to talk about a couple of issues that are hitting the press hard and that are topical and important in Japanese politics. Michael, what's on your radar these days? I, I'm going to be sound like I'm really trendy, but I really was very interested in the national vote that was taken by the country's zoos and aquariums on the issue of whether or not they're going to continue accepting dolphins from the dolphin hunt that's held in Taiji, yes. Wakayama Prefecture. I was am amazed, not that the, the measure, which was whether they're going to stay within the international uh, zoological regime called Waza, or whether they're going to go outside of it. I was amazed that, not that they passed the measure, but that 43 of the votes were for secession. Mm -hmm. This is an extraordinary thing. You, you think that means you won't be taking part in international information exchanges. You won't be able to get borrow animals from zoos overseas. You won't be able to do so many things. How could 43 of these institutions in Japan be so hidebound as to say, no, we're, we, we're, we're willing to cut ourselves off from the rest of the world. That was really surprising to me. The, mm. the measure passed. Most of the aquariums and zoos in Japan agreed with the measure that, and they will not from now on be accepting dolphins from mm -hmm. this. The, the issue then moves on now to Chinese and Mideast aquariums and zoos, which are still the biggest uh, customers of the Taiji dof dolphin uh, hunters. Well, this is an outgrowth of that uh, fabulous documentary, The Cove, that was released, what, eight, ten years ago. Mm -hmm. And certainly the, the, the reaction is very much a gut reaction. And of course there is, in Taiji itself, a, uh, a dolphin show. So it's it's really, really bizarre kind of situation mm -hmm. where you, you watch live dolphins demonstrating their intelligence and their, uh, their beauty, and right next door, they're you know, stabbing them to death. It's, it's really a very, very strange juxtaposition, but I was really stunned by the number of, of secession votes. Well, I think that example just uh, clarifies uh, the influence of gaiatsu, the, the pressure brought to bear on issues that are purely Japanese, that they just can't seem to break through, and just the added value of what foreigners are, are thinking of those issues and how, how these issues are somehow resolved. Although it is purely a, a Japanese issue, how it's decided, but it has impl implications and impact throughout you know, the rest of the world too. So that was what I, was surprising for me this week. What about you, Dr. Snow? Well, I just wanted to add too, within this context of where they're getting the dolphins, there's a larger issue at play. And what's the Japanese word for the outside foreign pressure? Gaiatsu. 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 So it's, it, I think it's just another example of Japan as it's raising its profile. It's happening. Speaking it is happening. in Congress. Be careful what you wish for, because the whole world is then going to say, well, we have something to say about mm -hmm. what's going on in Japan. And there was a, a film, Blackfish, sort of a follow-up to The Cove. It's much more of a U.S. context, but it has to do with the corralling of these animals. And internationally, a lot more people are against the zoos and the aquariums mm -hmm. uh, to begin with. And, and not, it's not just about where they're getting the, the fish or the, the mammals to put in the aquariums. And so I, I guess that caught you by surprise, just the, that so many had worked together to say we're not going to take them well, from... It's, it's also yeah. that there's, there's, a, a, there's an aging Japan story yes. in terms of this because mm -hmm. the animals in Japanese zoo, zoos are aging rapidly. Oh no. And, oh yes. We're going to have to adopt animals <laughs> in addition to towns. No, that, well that, yes. that's right. But in, but in this <laughs> case, the, the zoos are simply not displaying animals anymore because they have to compete in terms of purchases mm -hmm. with... Chinese interests with uh, places all over the world, which are have raised the prices of these animals, and so what we're seeing very often now 
are displays with extremely old animals in them. Okay, uh -huh. they're not retired. They're kept in the zoos for as long as they're still alive. Uh, it, it, you, you shake your head, but it's a natural <laughs> thing that happens. And if you're not part of the international sharing of animals and genetic material, which is what that vote meant, that means that you're not going to have anything. You're not going to have breeding programs. You're not going to have clients that are going to take other stock from, from you. you. There's nothing. You will have, and that's what they. That's what forty three. You know, basically a third of Japan's zoos and aquariums voted for. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. complete isolation, which means the, that they'll go out of business. That's that. There's something more than just gaiats there. There's there's, there's mm. a there's a real there, there's a real nationalist sense of of, sure. of, a, of a front mm -hmm. that, that that you foreigners are coming in trying to tell us what to do. Yeah, but you know we're all on one world, and yeah. that's and to, to say we're going to succeed. It just brings back memories of Japan pulling out of the League of Nations prior, in 1930. One world, that's kind of overrated, mm. Michael. Well, <laughs> I teach a class in globalization, so I'm I, kidding. I, I, <laughs> so that that still exists that 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 sense of of um, classical neoconservatism, and that's part of the dynamic in the opposition parties, the burning issue that we're talking about today, and kind of the the, the stickiness of, of moving policies and politics and, and forming coalitions here. Well, just to tie it up, today is Friday, mm -hmm. and every Friday in LDP headquarters is whale meat day. Mm -hmm. So that, that in the, their cafeteria, the only, uh, what, the only uh, entrees that you can choose are either fried whale meat or whale meat curry. Mm -hmm. So it, it's all a part of this so this nationalistic kind of yeah. uh, posturing, it's, it's posturing, <laughs> mm -hmm. okay? It's not necessarily nationalism pure and simple. And so there's a lot, I mean, they're politicians, so they're making kinds of stances. Yes. Uh, they're making a statement. And a lot of this is, is going on even today, but I, I sense that there are changes being made. This vote that was uh, just announced this week is, is a good signal that, that we are making progress. It's not this a one is world, really but. fascinating to me because I think it's a sign that a lot of the politics now is identity driven, sort mm -hmm. of, again, the nationalism with we are this and we are different from them, them yeah. being either the rest of the world or sure. other parts of Asia. So it doesn't have or to with, be- Or even within Japan, we're different from them. We don't, right. we don't do it that way. Right. But, yeah. but this, is, this, is, this is basic. Values that we're talking about. Yeah. The animals that are that are sold out of the Taiji hunt, they are chased for days. They're corralled into this cove. The ones that are going look young, healthy, and are saleable as live animals are separated out, and the others are killed. And you're supposed to you're you're a zoo keeper, right? Right. All right. You're supposed to be taking care of the animals, and you get animals out of this. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and can look at yourself in the mirror and say, no, no, there was no animal cruelty here. No, but, but the But the leader of the delegation said, this is not on its face cruel and unusual punishment, right? He, 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 he made that statement. He says, yes, the drive itself is offensive. Uh, the drive itself is effective, but it's not necessarily cruel. Well, it's interesting. Remember last year, Ambassador Kennedy tweeted she, about she this did. and she got a lot of she got a pushback. pushback and I don't believe she's been referencing it mm -hmm. since. Yeah. But at, the tweet itself was mm -hmm. pretty mild, but it was just a concern. And I really celebrated that she did that because I thought it's her right. Yes. She ought to be able to speak to that. And I think that for many people outside of Japan, it is a global concern. for. For anyone I've come across who may not be pro-Japan, that's often the context that they'll well, use. What a difference! Is the a, cove or what? What a difference a, a year makes. You yes. Know, were she to tweet now, probably there would not be a, a, a backlash against that. Mm -hmm. But listen, there are lots of other issues that are going on right now. So before we get into our our burning issue of today, what other issues are on on the roadmap? What are what are hitting your radar? Oh. I was going to add the Olympic story with the stadium. Mm -hmm. Huge uh, issue. It, it having to do with maybe we're not going to go with a cover now, right? Looked like a bicycle the, the roof, helmet or the, the roof something was else, one of the dynamic right? features of that that yes. design. Yes. 
So because in, I remember in Beijing, I was there right before the 08 Olympics. And of course they had their gorgeous stadium and everybody was having pictures taken. So it becomes really the symbol of the Olympics, the, the stadium. And the reason for not having the roof is because of what? A budget problem. So that then signals, ooh, a little trouble ahead mm -hmm. for the Olympics, this scaling down. How do you handle the PR surrounding that without it uh, making people a little skittish about what's happening with this Japanese economy? Mm -hmm. Are they really gonna be prepared? You remember when, when Abe went there to Brazil and they, they won the bid, it was that Japan, uh, Tokyo of the three bid cities, it was in the safest hands and Abe said Fukushima's under control. And so that's been a big part of the PR around being ready for the Olympics is that uh, uh, Tokyo was a much better choice than Istanbul and uh, was it Madrid? Madrid right. Yeah. Well, the issue that grabbed me on that one was not so much that we're not going to have the roof anymore. It's not going to be retractable. It's not going to be according to the original design, was how the news was delivered. The news was delivered by the Minister of Sports, Education, and what? Mext. It's Mext, uh, right, that's right. Right, the, <laughs> right. The Ministry of, formerly the Ministry of Education, it's got other things mm -hmm. yeah. compiled in it. Uh, Minister Shimomura went to visit the governor of Tokyo and told him for the first time, A, it doesn't look like it's going to fit, uh, we're running out of time, and by the way, this is, how much it's going to cost, and this is your portion. Ooh. And Governor um, Matsuzoi just went. Governor bonkers. Matsuzoi um, just lost it because he had not gotten an update. He thought everything was on schedule, and now he's getting this news. And by the way, you know, one third of the budget is yours. Let's not forget that. Wow. Well, the 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 Olympics have, has been for me uh, a, a source, not if not of amusement, or at least of. Uh, skepticism mm -hmm. because immediately the persons who were put in charge of it were old, I mean, really old oh, people gosh, and, yeah. and cronies of the uh, prime minister, uh, particularly, of course, his own former uh, faction leader, Mr. Mori, former prime minister Mori, was made the, the, the chairman. And then the person who was supposed to become the BOJ, head of the BOJ, Mr. Muto, uh, a former finance ministry official, was made second in command. Both of them well advanced in age. And the youngest person involved is uh, Toyota Akio, the head of, of Toyota Motors. And we know he has plenty of time to be dealing with these issues. So that there was, there was no youthful mm. spark in anything. Mm. And surprise, surprise, here we are a year and a half later mm. and nothing has been done except mm -hmm. the destruction of the national mm -hmm. stadium. Mm. But isn't this how it always happens? I mean, you have an Olympic committee that is comprised of the powerful and the elite, and then they, they trickle down from there. But I, I think this is what happens probably in every country. Yeah, but the whole point of having an Olympics is a rejuvenation of the country, a revitalization mm. of the country. And if you're going to have 80-year-olds and 70-year-olds as the people leading it, I'm sorry, they may not even be alive in time, sure. you know, when, the, when the, by, by opening ceremony. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's asking for trouble. Yeah, but I think everybody accepts that. It's a wink and a nod, and we give it to the elders because in this society, they're the ones that get, you know, they collect all of the, the, the credibility throughout their lives, and people kowtow, they bow down to people who are in positions of power and authority, and that's how the politics the political machine typically works here. But again, if you want to attract people to Japan, I think it's signaling. I remember when they showed the pictures of these elder men mm -hmm. involved on the Olympic and Committee. And it is men. Yes. It is men. Oh, well, men. yeah, that goes without saying. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah because there are, there are no women athletes <laughs> right. at, at the Olympics, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when it played in the foreign press, you should have read the comments mm. section because it was just, <laughs> Japan is like a, a big uh, retirement home. Ger I mean, it, gerontocracy. It just, yes, yeah. gerontocracy. It is a gerontocracy. And so, well, okay, is that where you want to spend your money? That, do you really want to come to the Olympics in 2020 uh, if, it's, if it's just going to be running into people mm -hmm. who are in their sunset years? Yeah, I don't know. I think that's kind of beside the point. I think this Olympics will be like the Olympics of 1964 that propelled this country 
tremendously, I mean, changed the entire makeup of the economy and, and distribution of, of population and the, the high-speed railways, it did an enormous amount for this country. Right, which means that the 2020 Olympics won't be anything like the 64. Yeah, I mean, yeah. what you just described is is going to point to the contrast uh, because it, it, they're dealing with much larger problems now. That was about the promise of Japan. Mm -hmm. And that was also right before two decades of the, the boom years. And right. so I, I'd love to be optimistic and I'm very excited that Tokyo got the bid. I'm all for it. But I do think that there are going to be a lot of other pork belly tougher issues that they're dealing with. Still think the Japanese are going to put on a grand show. And the most impressive part by far will be the people you meet at the konbini at the in the retail and who are just they're the front line of your ambassadors right mm -hmm. there. And they couldn't be more welcoming and polite. And I think by then, too, the language barrier will be less of a problem. So people are going to be impressed when they're here. Well, the cer but, certainly the, the technology will be so intense yeah. that a person who does not speak a word of Japanese will be able to go anywhere with as long as they have something like a mobile phone or some That's kind right. of electronic <laughs> device. The, the device will be able to do anything That's while it's here, mm -hmm. including being your wallet. You mm -hmm. don't have to change money. Yeah. Exactly. That, if that, you can date somebody through your phone, then you ought to be able to get around the city. <laughs> I mean, we have plenty of apps now. Yeah, for <laughs> yeah so that's that's coming. Well, we can be positive about that. But uh, how about this week's burning issue? No, before we get into that, there are lots of other issues <laughs> to talk about. What happened in Osaka and the implications of of um, the the mayor of Osaka win, uh, losing that referendum mm. so that he can cobble this entire prefecture together. I mean, that was huge. Okay, the really surprising thing was not that they lost, but that they lost by 10,000 votes. Very, very mm. th it small was, margin. It was an incredibly small margin out of you know, uh, like 49% to versus 50%. It's just mm. well, less than a percentage point of difference. And gosh darn, he quits. Well, I mean, there were shenanigans going on in the background too, even within the LDP. So yes, you can point your finger very, very directly at certain people and say, you know, we almost had it. If you had participated, if you had weighed in like you were supposed to, we would have been okay. Okay, let's, let, let's lay the groundwork first, okay? okay? The LDP was split, which is, hasn't been since Abe became prime minister on this issue. Mm -hmm. The local prefectural level was against the unification of Osaka into a single metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's item one. The local the, chapter of the LDP in Osaka. In Osaka, right. Was dead set against it. So dead set against it, it had joint rallies with the Communist Party. Yes. Which was also against it. Joint LDP Communist rallies. They I don't have great know, parties. I don't, bedfellows. I don't know when that lever happened before, if mm -hmm. ever. Okay? Against them is Mr. Hashimoto and his Jap Japan Innovation Party, which is a Kansai, Osaka-based party, and the national government of Mr. Abe, who welcomes and, 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 and visits Mr. Hashimoto, Chief Cabinet Secretary Suga expresses his, mis his confusion why the LDP in Osaka is against th this wonderful idea of Mr. Hashimoto's. And you're saying the LDP is a house divided on this yes. one, right? You've got the national government, you've got the prime minister and the chief cabinet secretary on your side. I don't see what the point is if you m miss by less than a percentage mm. point. What? You, okay, maybe you promise that you're going to re resign. But if it's less than a percentage point, you say, oh, come on. Yes. was 10,000 votes, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of busloads more of people going from one side to the other, and we've done this thing. What but was this unification about? Is it in part sort of a place branding initiative? Is it a way to get more attention from the world to Osaka? No, it's a or, political move. Okay. It's, it's, to, to, um, it's right now two different uh, administrative area. It is the city of Osaka mm. and the prefecture of mm -hmm. Osaka. 
and he was the mayor of, of Osaka, mm. and what he was trying to do was consolidate the entire administration of the city, like Tokyo. Tokyo mm -hmm. is comprised of the city of Tokyo, well, which includes right, 23 well, wards. Well, that's a, well, has, well it's, it, he, it's, it's, a, it's a Tokyo Osaka thing. Yes, it is. Uh, Tokyo is Never a ending. metropolitan government. And, and it's a really strange thing. It's called the metropolitan government. So when you, you say, where do you live? I live in the metropolitan government. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, it's not like the metropolitan area, like or DC, right? <laughs> right. right. The, the District of Columbia. Huh. No, we, we live in the, the in the metropolitan government, but it has all these sub. The subsets are a whole bunch of cities, but everything is run. The prefecture and the, the metro area are the same, mm. and it's got a lot of prestige for some reason. It's mm -hmm. the only. Uh, prefecture that's organized this way. Mm -hmm. And Osaka, because either it has a chip on its shoulder or it has a branding issue like you suggested, or there's some kind of, I have yet to hear what the reason is that they need to move from prefecture and cities to a metropolitan unit. There's there's something that, that's going on there in terms of pride, but maybe there is something well, also. Well, no, I think it's a power play. I, the governor of Tokyo, Matsuzoi, is kind of on a par with not a member of parliament, but several political parties combined. I mean, he welds enormous power because he is the governor of, of Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And so what he says matters. And this little snit that he had with the Minister of Education last week on, you know, this is this the Olympic Stadium is not going to have a roof and it's going to be a little mm. bit late, you know. What, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. I mean, he can say that. Yeah, well, the, mm -hmm. Tokyo, the, 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 the three local governments in the world, most powerful local governments, if you look at their economies, are the state of California, so the governor of California is a big deal, mm. the state of, New, of Texas, number three is, is the governor of Tokyo ah. in, in terms of GDP. Mm. How about that? So uh, the, he really is a big figure. Mm -hmm. and He talks for a lot of business. He talks for a lot of Japan's cultural power. Right. Right? So... If you tick him off, which the government has done, uh, and which I predicted would happen uh, in an in a op-ed that I wrote a, long, a while back when he first got elected, that it wasn't going to go well, even though he was elected with LDP and Kobeito mm. support, uh, you've got a problem right in your capital where your government buildings are located. Yes. It's not like you can avoid him because mm -hmm. he's right there nearby. Right. Well, Hashimoto was great. He's young, seven kids, a lawyer. He really energized uh, politics in Osaka. Mm. He is uh, one of the rare new leaders. I mean, he's dynamic, he's young, he appeals to a lot of people. And I think his vision was, let's make Osaka a place that can actually compete on an equal footing with Tokyo. You know, we're, we're moving into the future. I want Osaka to be strong too. And I thought his, his idea and his vision was really good, and you know we're we're going to reduce um, administ administrative costs, which, which suck up for uh, a lot of con uh, for a lot of municipalities, 20, 30 percent of all of the tax revenue, just just the machinery. He was going to reduce that and have a more centralized control. I thought it was a, a, a good idea. But you said he quit, or no? What he did was he says, if I don't win this referendum, I will resign uh, and I will leave politics right. entirely. So now yes. what is he going to do? He's left politics. Well, he said He'll that once be before. Back. He will be back. He will be back. <laughs> he is, he's got too much wind in his sails. He can't stay out. Politics, these guys, this is about power. But he's, well, he comes from out. Out, of, out of television, right? He was a, a TV Radio commentator first, right. uh, in the Osaka area. You, a big uh, hit as someone, uh, a, a smart aleck. And mm -hmm. he is an incredibly smart guy. And he comes from the wrong side of the tracks. Yes. Uh, uh, he, so he's got that appeal, that Osaka yeah. appeal. He's got, right. the, he's, he's a, he has a, a definite Osaka background and an Osaka ring to him. Mm -hmm. So he, a he jokester? Would, Not no. a jokester, a... Um, <laughs> no, but that, that, that's <laughs> right. They is, have is, different is that, humor in Osaka. Have, <laughs> Japan's I mean, comedians do come from Osaka, from, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, from the, the manzai Something tradition. Something in the water. Some of the best food comes from Osaka. <laughs> yeah, but in, in this case, he, he there is a... There's always a big discussion whether you really should call his father, whom he really didn't know, a Yakuza or not, mm -hmm. a gangster. You know, he was a tattooed guy who had very strange sources of income. Let's put it that way. Hmm. Uh, so he was raised in basically a single mother family, uh, worked very hard to get where he is. 
So he's a real story,、mm. okay, and it, and, it, really, it and really、like、a, appealing in a country which is basically run by an aristocracy. Exactly,、mm-hmm. uh, yeah. something I'm that's completely new. Com- completely oh, he's new. It's a good story. It's a good story,、uh, but he comes off. If you quit when you're just almost there, it makes you look like a dilettante、mm-hmm. that you were only in it, you know, for the winning. Sometimes you lose. Yeah. When you get that close, though, you know that、yes. hurts even yes. more. Yes, yes, it does.、Right. <laughs> If he had lost in the first round, big, and then it wouldn't be as bad. But to not to cut this discussion、yeah. off, it's really interesting. But I want to switch to one final topic that's not our burning issue today, but it deals with nuclear power. Of the thirteen issues of Tokyo on Fire we've had, the most popular was our discussion on nuclear power,、hmm. nuclear energy、hmm. in Japan, and there's been some movement over the last couple of weeks on starting nuclear power. Uh, nuclear power production. Once again, there have been a couple of lawsuits. There have been a couple of challenges by、um, municipalities, by the citizens. The the safety regulations are not strict enough. Don't start this. But now there's been some movement just this last week. Yeah, the 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 re- agency that's regulating the、uh, restarts、uh, approved one more nuclear power plant, and it's in a place that is just asking for trouble. It's in Ehime Prefecture, and it's on a peninsula. A very long pencil of land that is extremely mountainous, and it's halfway down it. So、mm-hmm. anyone living past it has to somehow be evacuated.、Mm. If it happens during a typhoon, or something happens during a rainstorm, or any, or even if there's just an, an earthquake, typhoon, uh, uh, tsunami situation like we had、uh, in the, the case of Fukushima, these people have no place to go. And there's no way to evacuate、mm-hmm. them. There's no roads because it's the end of a pen- very thin peninsula. You, if you look at the map or look at a photograph of this thing, you say, "That's crazy." It is crazy. But Michael, it passed its safety inspection. And that's right. It passed its safety inspection. It、uh, how it did that, God only knows.、Uh, but it did, and it's the next. It's the next battleground.、Mm-hmm. It'll be the next place where they're going to go to the courts. And you look at that site and you say. That's an open invitation yes, it,、yeah. for another Fukui ruling that the the the, the、uh, evacuation is simply not doable.、Mm. Sure.、Mm. Well, the initial claim by the citizens against restarting was, we don't care about your safety standards. Those safety those safety standards do not meet our criteria.、Mm. That it's not fail safe.、Mm-hmm. So, it's it's still an issue. It's still evolving. You know, Japan is、uh, really lacking、uh, the power that was produced substantially by、uh, nuclear power, about thirty percent before the Fukushima disaster. The longer this goes, though, without the nuclear power plants up and going, it suggests that Japan doesn't need all this nuclear power. I mean, to the world, it's really a surprise that、mm-hmm. they were able to take those offline after three eleven,、oh. and they haven't really put them back online. So, as an environmentalist type, I would、mm-hmm. think, oh, well, this is a good argument for what's the big deal? Yeah,、sure. alternative. I mean, you've managed to kind of keep the economy going.、Mm-hmm. So, well, what's your recipe? Well,、here? fortunately, the price of oil and and、uh, liquid、uh, gas has has、Worked、declined. Worked in its、yes. favor. Yeah, but、right. and it will eventually go up. That's、yeah. one. But what the government has has switched gears and says. We now have to be better environmental citizens in terms of carbon emissions,、mm-hmm. uh, because we we went off the、uh, we got off the wagon, or we we fell off the wagon. I guess is the term、mm-hmm. that we say,、mm-hmm. uh, and、uh, we need to get back on. What with the Kyoto Protocol and well, yeah, we we have carbon. We have our international commitments to how much we're going to reduce our our carbon、mm-hmm. emissions, and、They're、we fell we fell way off it because we've replaced. Our nuclear power plants. So the the government's showing that it you know it has some idea, and also this government is committed、mm-hmm. to restarts. It's just ideologically committed, so that if anybody brings up renewables, they start seizing up and they start get getting very nervous.、Mm-hmm. Well, look, I I apologize for talking so much about these subsidiary issues. I'd like to get into the burning issue today, which is opposition parties here in Japan. And with that, I'd like to talk first of all about the ruling party, the Liberal Democratic Party. Now, what's its history? How it was formed? Where it came from? Why is it so powerful? Do you have any thoughts on that, Michael? The party was established in 1955 in response to the unification of the socialist parties.、Uh, there were 
two major conservative parties that were considered sort of left of center and well right of center, and they merged and formed the Liberal, Liberal Democratic Party. And together with the, the merged socialist parties, they formed what was called the 1955 system. Under the 1955 system, the LDP remained the permanent party in power, and the socialists remained their constant uh, carping rivals. Mm -hmm. And there was under the table and, and, and behind the scenes a lot of interaction between the two main parties. Sometimes the socialists would win a few more seats, sometimes the LDP would win a few more seats, but there was a great deal of interaction and a great deal of, well, you, you, double dealing, I don't know what you want to call it, but they, they were able to communicate on issues and were able to talk about uh, getting what kind of uh, items would be getting through the diet, how much the socialists would be opposing it. They, they worked out a sort of a play, a script ahead of time mm -hmm. under the 1955 system. And there was even money going from the LDP to the socialists. Not just from the LDP and not just within Japan. There well, was a lot of facilitation going on from Washington, D.C. as well. As well yeah. Of course, and CIA. I mean, yeah. Tim Weiner has written about this in the history of the CIA, that they were very, LDP was financed by the CIA because it was an anti-communist party, and that's what helped uh, someone like Kishi come into play after being in jail for three years mm -hmm. and under suspicion for war crimes. A lot of these people were released because they were... They were the intelligentsia. <laughs> under, they were yes, the, the aristocracy. They needed some leaders to put in place, but the U.S. has fingerprints all over the LDP. Sure. Okay, so yeah, they do at, at the origin. But ever since then, it's been, it's been a, a, a perpetu self-perpetuating system that lasted until they made a lot of money, mm -hmm. right? Until the 1980s. And the corruption from construction companies uh, trying to bid for contracts and winning the allegiance of various ministers. The, the, the system that was set up basically by uh, the rise of Tanaka Kakue, mm -hmm. Kakue Tanaka. It the, worked. It worked. Uh, it was, he had, to, he had to find a way to win a, the allegiance of other members of the party. Money was the way that he mm -hmm. did it. He focused on the rural areas. He yeah. focused on pork barrel um, projects, highways, distributing, um, you know, polit uh, public funds. Yeah, it was pork barrel politics with movement both ways, not mm -hmm. just the top down, but uh, coming back up. So it developed into a system and it was corrupt. It was mm -hmm. so corrupt that when it finally broke down, the amounts of money that they would find inside the homes of these politicians were astronomical. Yes. Okay. <laughs> At that point, the, the socialists uh, weren't able to take over. They just had been so much a party of vocal opposition, but, opposition. but, but also they were part of the system mm -hmm. that the move came that we had to forge something else. And that's where the breakdown took place in 1993, led by Japan's great destroyer, Ozawa Ichiro, who broke the LDP apart, took some of them, cobbled together a whole bunch of opposition parties, various sizes, and formed the first non-LDP government. Mm -hmm. And 93 was when Abe really got his start, though, in politics. Well, so, he was, yes. I love timelines. Yes. Yeah. So, well, no, so, his, his, so his identity is in part formed sure. mm -hmm. by the, the time that the LDP lost for the first time. And they hated it. Suddenly, there weren't all these businesses coming to their offices. Suddenly, there weren't all these parties that they could go to. Mm -hmm. They were no longer... The, the, the big men on campus, if you want to put it that way. And they, sure, they, they found a way to get back in power. And the way they got back in power was joining hands with the socialists and, become, and putting a socialist as prime minister, Murema Tomoe Tomiichi. That's right. And boy, oh boy. Well, there's socialism and then there's socialism. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, so. well, in Japan, there's, <laughs> you know, there's communists, but they're not really right. communists. So, I mean, everything is, I mean, you import something into Japan and within just a very brief period of time, it becomes Japanese what it was originally. It, it becomes changed and, and modified to what it, whatever it is that they wanted it to be. Yeah, but the socialists in making that deal 
Yes, they, it hurt. They killed themselves. They sure did. They, they gave up their traditional opposition to the existence of the self-defense forces. Mm -hmm. They gave up so much just to have a prime minister. And after that, they had absolutely no electoral poll, mm -hmm. which opened the door for the DPJ, right. that, which was formed out of the remnants of the explosion of 1993 and slowly accreted and created eventually a unified group of, of opposition candidates who could at least sit offer, in a room together sit in a room together and offer an alternative to the LDP and the popularity of the LDP was declining mm -hmm. all the way through the 1980s 1990s the number of total votes that they were getting was going down every election mm -hmm. so the day of reckoning was going to come someday right and it came in 2009 and what a great time in Japanese politics that was I mean, there was so much enthusiasm, there was so much newness and freshness, and a lot of new um, diet members who were in, engaged in the political process and trying to distance themselves from, from, the, from the bureaucrats. The and old yes, guard. this you were affiliated with the LDP and you guys are kind of doing the same thing, so we're going to assume some of that. We're going to be writing bills, we're going to be having hearings, and everybody's going to be sitting around. A, a, you remember this, this, these huge tables with the cameras there, and. Where did you spend the money and where are the receipts for that? And calling people on the mat, it was really fabulous. Yeah, and it was naive as all hell. Yes, it was, it didn't last. Uh, the thought that you could take on an establishment that had been in power for decades and decades and that you could just start ordering things around and things would go your way, that was incredibly mm -hmm. naive. They made way too many enemies way too fast. Yes. They didn't think that if you're going to they had not yet killed the LDP. The LDP was still around. And naively, they thought that the LDP would be as nice and as reasonable in opposition as they had been. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fools. Yes. Fools. They, the LDP's reason for existing is holding power. Mm -hmm. it, has nothing, it has nothing else to do. It, you can see on their website, they actually have, um, they have concepts that they wish to defend, and they're pretty good. And the manifesto. The manifesto. And, and, and if you look at it, it's actually much more convincing than the current DPJ right. uh, manifesto. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, their real purpose is the pursuit of power. And being out of power meant that they would do anything, and they did. Well, isn't that politics? I mean, the whole reason why you are in politics, the reason why you would cobble together a coalition or even form a party is so that your voice can be heard, so that people will come to you with issues of importance that they want you to change. Yes. Yeah, but what he's describing is more elite level communication. Mm -hmm. So there is politics where the people really have an ability to speak back to their politicians. But the way I view Japan, it's at this level, it's predominantly men, it's older. There aren't really many avenues for newcomers to get involved. You don't have any movement of independent sort of non-affiliated types here the way you have in the U.S. with the independent voter is the mm -hmm. is the fastest growing sort of non-democrat non-republican voter and so now candidates have to appeal to the independents who have some conservative and some more liberal mm -hmm. values so it it's just it looks very narrow and elitist here yes because they and don't, not they don't have this, to appeal to the to Right. The As you said, they really don't. Yeah, they we're don't not have talking to, about the people. They don't here. have to appeal to the independents because the independents don't show up at the polls. Mm -hmm. And the, the demonstration of, of the power of that was the difference in the number of total votes between 2009 and 2012. In 2009, when the DPJ took over in a massive landslide victory, there was a the highest voting rate since the 1960s. It was huge. So there's it was huge. your enthusiasm. Yeah, there was the enthusiasm. Describing. Three years later, almost the record low, 10 million <sighs> voters mm -hmm. out, of the, out of the 100 million voters failed to show up. Gosh. That they had, they had been there at the, just three years before. Mm -hmm. The country was that demoralized. Well, they did and, it to themselves. And, 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 yeah. and the thing is, that is continuing. This last House of Representative election was the lowest ever, not mm -hmm. just by a little, but by a lot. And the elections that we just had in April were the lowest ever. You don't have to appeal to the independents. They're not there. Mm -hmm. So that, what do you have to appeal to? Your base. And that's it. Right. And that's also where the media come into play here, as a, or the media as a system. If you can then, even with this very low and declining voter turnout, 
turn it into a great front page story where you show Abe or the LDP and they're mm -hmm. celebrating their victory, then of course that looks like, ah, oh, look, we're, we're very stable. You still like us. We're, it, it, it just sends such a mm -hmm. false message, but the media are largely so cowed to the ones who are in power sure. here that they keep perpetuating that image. And to your point, or I think both of you have said, I mean, who's really at fault here with DPJ? All the excitement, even when I returned to Japan after 16 years, I came back in 2010, people were asking me, what do you think of the DPJ? Mm -hmm. I didn't even know about the DPJ. Uh -huh. I'm just here for 10 days to give talks on Obama. But I knew that, oh, there's something happening here that is quite a fissure in national mm -hmm. politics. And I didn't realize how much LDP had dominated because mm -hmm. I'd never really studied Japanese politics that closely. Mm -hmm. But so whose fault is that? Is it, is it really in terms of democratic theory? Is it the people? not really uh, maintaining their interest or their engagement? Or with DPJ, were they just amateurs because they hadn't been in office and they didn't quite know what to do? They were all thumbs or something Yeah, like I, that. I think that has a lot to do with it. You know, the, the DPJ is a, a great collection, especially at the leadership level, of really sterling people, dynamic people, mm. you know, real, real leaders, uh, mm. able to reach people and, and to talk to people and collect votes. And, and that sort of thing. But this quality of leadership, I think, escaped them. I think they just didn't know how to lead. Um, and they had a shot and they couldn't get it together. They thought would try these new things. I thought it was a great idea, but it just didn't quite gel. There was, they had great ideas. They have, do have great personnel. They have great uh, people, especially their uh, female candidates. They're not, they're, they're, they aren't uh, the female party, even though they, they put themselves as, as liberal. Actually, the LDP is actually a little more accessible mm -hmm. for women candidates, even though they run fewer of them. But the problem was that, first of all, they made they ran on the bureaucrats are our enemy. That's right. And you get into power, guess whom you have to rely on? Well, the, the bureaucracy. Now, the I'm bureaucracy has been much. here far longer than the, the LDP right. or any of the parties it, or even before the war. Yeah. They've been here. They are solid. Yeah, they're there. And... And they're a tool. They're not your enemy. But there was this ideological bent that they had. Even under Koizumi, sure, he, yeah. he tried they, to rein them in. Yeah, bring, you rein them in, but you, you, with incentives. You don't condemn them because they're your underlings. They're, they're the people you have to rely on. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was mistake number two. The second mistake was the DPJ came into power thinking that it had achieved power. No. The people had given it to them. Mm -hmm. The people mm -hmm. were rejecting the LDP. Mm -hmm. They wa wanted a new way of organizing Japan. And the, the, the people's basic view, uh, and you, the view of editorialists, of writers and everything, was that if we can fix the politics of Japan, we can fix Japan. Because Japan has been in the doldrums since the 19, late 1980s. We, and the reason why that's true is because our politics is sick. Mm -hmm. If we fix that, if we get a dynamic, a competitive system, we'll be able to fix the rest of what's wrong with Japan. Maybe a two-party system. Yeah, maybe right. a two-party system might be more than that. Uh, so they gave them the, their power. You know, if you think that you were elected because of your policies or your personal excellence, and what's in, in fact happened is that the people we're just sick of the alternative, you're going to, if you don't keep that in mind every single day saying, the people are the source of the information, not us. Right. The people are the source of the ideas, not us. Because if we stop listening to the people, if we don't have real, really close understanding of what it is that they want us to do, we're going to fail, they, you mm -hmm. fail. And they did. Yeah. They, lo they, they, they lost control of the narrative and as a response, the people abandoned them. Yes, I'd like to say that we are on the cusp of seeing more change and more more dynamic um, involvement of the electorate in Japanese politics. But I think actually the opposite is true. I think the uh, 1955 system is being revised, but the LDP will be in power. It will remain in power. It will never let what happened to it earlier happen again. I mean, they are determined 
not to have that happen again. Absolutely got it right. And that's what I called it in my piece. It's a hardening of political arteries here. Mm -hmm. No question. Yeah. I don't see it opening up. And okay. it, it's very discouraging because all those voters that the DPJ didn't acknowledge, mm -hmm. they're the ones not voting now. Yes. Well, what happens to them? Do they vote? Do they change parties? What happens to them? It's the same thing that's happening in Osaka with Ishinoto, the revitalization party. Uh, is it revitalization? Yeah, they, they changed it to innovation, but God knows what it is now. Okay, well, it's, the yeah, exactly. is it's just I mean, it's changing right now. Right. But there are, there are members of the Diet who belong to that party, who are in the opposition. They need to go someplace else unless something happens and this centrifugal force is brought back to bear. I mean, it's just now scattering, or well, it's on the verge well, of scattering. Well, let's go back to the, the beginning where we, okay. we talked about the Osaka referendum. Hashimoto says he's resigning from, from politics. Because he's the co-leader, the other co-leader, Eda Kenji, uh, who is sort of a recruit from yet another party, mm -hmm. uh, he, which is, which is also defunct, which was uh, Watanabe Yoshimi's party, uh, that party split apart and Eda brought with him. Eda felt, okay, my co-leader is take, falling on his sword, I have to fall yep. on mine. And this is an aside, when Eda Kenji leaves the room, you need to go out of the room too. Mm -hmm. He's got the best instincts for when to get off the bus than a, of any politician I've ever seen. So he's walked out. If anybody else d walks out with him, they're smart. Okay. But now, what have they done? They've elected as their new leader, Mr. Matsuno. Mr. Matsuno is a defector from the DPJ. And yesterday, he had his first meetings with all the heads of all the other parties. And here he goes into the very familiar offices of the DPJ. And there are all the DPJ officials. And they're all grinning at him and he's grinning at them. And they're all, for once the DPJ had something to smile about. Mm. They say, we got all these people. You still like me, right? And, they're, and, they're, <laughs> and, we're, and we're all friends. And yeah. you know, something good happened for us. Mm -hmm. And right now everyone's talking about yeah, a few defectors from the, the Japan Inf Innovation Party will become independents or something. But for the most part, the, what was Mr. Hashimoto's private uh, pet project will be absorbed right back into the DPJ. Mm -hmm. We can't talk about the opposition parties unless we talk really about the coalition between Jiminto and Komeito, how strong that is, the two-thirds majority that they're striving for, why they're striving for that, you know, what's coming up in the elections of 2016, um, the referendum for changing the constitution. Um, now you've got a, a possible uh, pool of loaning diet members. We, we don't have a party that we're really affiliated with and we'll vote with you. And the tradition is that when you join a party, you vote along party lines or else. So there's a lot of, uh, of um, change in the air. Yeah, well, the, the Japan Innovation Party, which is going to have to go up through some sort of breakup, because there's there are just some basic differences between the people who are like Matsuno, who are basically DPJ members who drifted into the, mm -hmm. the JRP. Uh, and there's a, there are a lot of them in the House of Representatives, and then a few of the House and Counselors people, and then this core of, of Hashimoto hardliners, right? That's going to have to split up at some point. And those hardliners most likely will align with, with the LDP. The game in this is not the House of Representatives. In the House of Representatives, the Komeito and the LDP together, they've got it covered. They've got, it covered. They've got the two-thirds majority that they need there uh, for any kind of constitutional re uh, action. They don't have that in the House of Counselors, which is why 2016 is so important, because at that point, the... DPJ has 58 members in the House of Counselors. 41 of those are up for re-election in 2016. That's the main core of remaining core of DPJ power. And the LDP desperately wanted to have the Japan Innovation Party as a confusing party, as a party to draw votes away from the DPJ in order to 
make it easier and smoother for the LDP to wipe out the DPJ in its last stronghold, mm -hmm. the 2016, the class of 2016 in the House of Councillors, and then grab the House of Councillors and finally have the ability to modify the Constitution. That's now, because of this, just this one referendum and 10,000 votes missed, that's, that's now a ripe opportunity. A ripe opportunity that may have been falling from the tree. Mm -hmm. Well, what about the opposition parties? I mean, we've got the Jiminto and Komeito. They've got a coalition. They control the upper. Uh, the, they control the House of Representatives. They don't quite control the uh, the the House of Councilors. The um, well, they have they the have the, they have the majority. They have 134 seats, mm -hmm. and you need, you need 121. So. Any legislation they can that they can want to the, pass, they're going to get it through. Oh, that's going to get it through. It's no problem uh, because you have the majority. The, the LDP by itself has a majority in the House of Representatives, and then the coalition has the majority mm -hmm. in the House of Councilors. So they could be spending their time passing whatever law they want, and mm -hmm. bang, 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 bang. And they're not. They're being politically smart. They're thinking about their image. They're thinking about doing things methodically. It's driving the United States crazy in the case of the uh, se the uh, security laws, which have yet to begin to be debated. Mm -hmm. When, uh, it, from the United States' point of view, it says, "You've got the votes. Vote on it. It's done." Uh, none of none of these. You, you promised. Know, yeah, you pr you actually had your guy come and talk to our Congress and tell us that it's already done. Right. You know. I'd say take your time. Yeah, they mm -hmm. do, and they're taking their time. They're right. being very careful about it because they're thinking about the possibilities of 2016, or at least they were They were until Sunday when 10,000 Osakans said, you know, the JIP, I mean, they are the Osaka party, but this is not a great idea. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Hashimoto, because of his headstrong behavior, says, okay, you don't like my idea? I'm quitting. That's mm -hmm. It's just changed the entire complexion of everything because now you the LDP doesn't have the ability to divide the electorate the opposite people who might want to vote for the opposition between two op main opposition parties mm -hmm. the JIP and the DBJ which is what happened in last December you know they had they made, did a lot of coordination at the last minute but still ended up in 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 more than 20 uh, districts ended up running against each other and knocking each other out when they were running against an. LDP. Well, the disarray. I mean, it's not just at election time. Even even the party is is some most of the time dysfunctional because of the infighting, and that's what turns voters off the most. That's what makes voters switch parties. And they they'll even vote for the communists, who are very stable. They have a good they have a good thread of intelligence, and they produce the Akahata, the newspaper. You know, they don't take the the, the government. Um, funds for political parties, they generate them themselves. It's a solid party. Yeah, and in this last set of local elections on the prefectural level, they, they gained. They gained, not only gained, they surpassed the, the DPJ as the, the number, and became the number three party in mm -hmm. the local assemblies. You know, that, that you had the, the, the LDP and the Cometo, and then number three position, bingo, the communists, because they are organized, and also they have their base. And if the independents don't show up, and which they didn't, then you go immediately only to the parties that have electoral bases. Mm -hmm. the, the LDP has its patron-client relationships with companies, farmers, construction firms, everything, and that's how it stays in power. The Komeito is the front party for mm -hmm. the Soka Gakkai religious order. Right. And then the communists have the teachers' unions and many other unions tied to it, and they have a solid voting base. Anybody who actually does politics based on policies, based on attracting independent voters, those parties, like the DPJ, of course they're doing mm -hmm. badly. And they are. And there's no, I mean, you're right, there is a hardening of the arteries. There's no outlook for that changing. Well, the other dynamic that's overlaid are the rural voters compared to the city voters and uh, the main metropolitan areas, Tokyo, Osaka, Fukuoka. The, the, the voters in those districts are proportionally disadvantaged by those who are in the outlying rural areas, and that's where uh, the LDP is the strongest, and it gets its, its, its strength basically from uh, massive projects, roads, highways, schools, 
uh, municipal buildings, that sort of thing. Well, that was the ultimate betrayal of the DPJ. The DPJ is basically an urban party. Mm -hmm. Can I say something? Sure. It's like getting into the minutia mm -hmm. of politics. No wonder people go and spend 300,000 yen on a little dog. I mean, <laughs> if people are so disconnected to politics here. I never have a political conversation mm. with anybody well, in Tokyo because it's not interesting. I mean, yeah. we're not talking policies or issues. We're talking about these different political leaders and these names don't mean anything to me. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they're going to mean unless these are experts who are tuning into the podcast, but it just it's so inside baseball. Yeah, it is it's like inside you guys baseball. are talking about the Yankees and the and it's just I'm disconnected from it. Okay, that. well, to me it is compelling. It is interesting because it has implications, immediate implications and far-reaching implications how how business is done and how here, here here's here Okay. And I, I'm alone. No, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a valid point. It's an extremely valid point, and here's my answer to that. Okay. Okay? Opposition parties don't have anything else to discuss ab except the fact that they're opposition parties. Mm -hmm. That's so sad. No, but, th but, think <laughs> of, but, but think about the unique political position that the, the Abe government is as compared to the governments of his peers all over the world. Yeah. He has... The votes in the legislature mm -hmm. to do anything. No, mm -hmm. I know. Okay. I know. It's astonishing. It's yeah, like he can do anything he wants. He said it could, it could be <laughs> it a could dictatorship. Be. Right. Okay. But he's holding back just a little mm. to, to make it look good. That's one. All right? So it's not as though the opposition is fighting against a force of evil. Mm. Uh, and and one of uh, and a great comment, Robert Dujaric of, of Temple University oh, yes. uh, calls <laughs> Abe a uh, sheep in wolf's clothing uh -huh. because uh, Abe t this week was defending the defense guideline I know, changes. That got very weird. And, and he, he and he said. We won't be sending Japanese troops into dangerous areas. Is that the uh, most hilarious thing? <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 uh, Robert Dujaric said, "Oh well, gosh, you know, what, well, then what are they? Why are you sending soldiers at all? I know if they can't exactly. go to dangerous places." Right. And so he called them the, you know, the sheep in wolf's clothing. And that's okay. That's one thing. So you're not dealing with a mad, raving blood dripping from his his jaws kind of person that you can use. You can uses some kind of, of uh, pivot point to show that we're not like him. Okay, right. that's one. The second thing is policies. Okay, you want to say that you're a more liberal party against the, the party which has the most radical debt-fueled expansionist economic policies mm. of any advanced economy in the world. Mm. What are you going to offer? In be that goes beyond what they've done in terms mm -hmm. of uh, mm -hmm. of expansion of the, the BOJ's uh, book mm -hmm. and also all the other aspects of Abenomics. The reforms that they're offering in terms of rules and regulations, deregulation, everything. It's the most liberal program. It's where the Liberal Democratic Party is actually acting liberal, mm -hmm. okay? Where are you going to be on the, the political spectrum? There's the communists, okay, and, but the LDP is right next to them, basically. There's, there's little space for, for you to stand mm -hmm. and make your stand and say, this is where I am. I can make stand no other place. Are you saying then the interest groups are mostly fully aligned with the LDP? Well, look, right? women's issues, Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? You would think that the conservative right. old guys club mm -hmm. would be a place where you could, okay, we, could, we'll, we'll, we'll use that angle. No, mm. the Abe administration owns that issue. Mm. It owns womanomics. It owns getting women into the workforce. It owns, you know, putting women into positions of power. It, take, it takes away a core issue that the uh, opposition might use as a way of getting attention. What about the rising gap between the rich and poor? I would relate that to TPP because 20 years ago when I worked at the U.S. Information Agency, we had to make a big push pro-NAFTA, and it was very controversial. There was a lot of pushback from labor and citizen groups and who were very worried about people meeting in private and not really giving a role for consumers or citizens to play in this. Well, that's exactly what's happening with TPP. I yeah. mean, most of it is 
behind closed doors. Because yeah, if but- you watch the way the debate's going in the U.S., you've got President Obama now doing his sort of uh, road show, and then you've got Democrats against mm-hmm. his going fast approach, the fast track, as we mm-hmm. called it, with NAFTA. So very, I mean, because Japan has a very uh, growing gap between the the rich and poor. I mean, mm-hmm. it's very much mirroring what's happened in the United States. Unfortunately, there. TPP is something that the Democrats were very, very much in yeah. favor of. In right. fact, they're Prime Minister Khan, parties. when he, he committed Japan to the TPP process, said it's going to be the, the new black ships that are going to yes. open up Japan. I've so the DBJ can't own that, okay? Yeah. And the, the major opponents to TPP are Japan's farmers who are. Well, I'm with the farmers. Yeah, well, then. the farmers, though, they're, they're, they are. <laughs> I'm not going to marry They're one, entirely with, bought no. in to the LDP system. Mm. They can make noises, they can make a whole bunch of. of uh, they can even have demonstrations, mm. whatever, but at the end of the day, they're not going to switch to the mm-hmm. DPJ. They're not going to vote for them. Right. So it, it's a done deal, mm. okay, in that regard. Again, Wherever you look on the policy map, the LDP is already there. Yeah. And at that point, we end up talking about inside baseball. Yeah. Right? Because we're not <laughs> sure talking do. about major policy issues. No. Mm-hmm. Okay? The, the, the issue, for example, of the self-defense forces and the right of collective self-defense. The DPJ is for it. The only difference they have is, is the methodology that was used constitutional mm-hmm. or not. Mm-hmm. We're for the expansion of Japan's mm. use of se- its security forces in global affairs. We're for it. We just don't like the particular set of steps that were done. That's all, mm-hmm. okay? What a mistake. Well, they I should mean, have been th- against it. This has been going on for, for years and years, yeah. I mean, especially with the LDP. They want to change the Constitution. I hear this almost every day. The Americans wrote that Constitution, so we want to get rid of it and have right. our own. Yeah. Doesn't that make you go, ooh, wait a oh, minute. Oh, yeah. And it was really quick. It was kind and of it was too quick. And yes. Yeah. You know. The, the uh, Abe administration is way too smart. It has a point man on this, Funada Hajime, uh, who is taking a lot of the flack and a lot of the, the heat regarding constitutional revision. And he's going to be basically interacting with the public and with the media mm-hmm. on this issue, taking it so that it seems as though it's a party issue, not an Abe government issue. Mm. And the Abe government will pick and choose. And I can almost guarantee you that the first thing that they're going to be doing is not going to be Article 9. That mm-hmm. I, can, sure. I can guarantee. The second thing is I'm almost, it, it's probably going to be gay marriage. Mm. You know, they're going to go, so, or something that more likely that the Komeito likes, like a declaration of environmental rights is something that the Komeito mm. has been talking about. Well, that, that's really great for the Komeito's main support, which is the Soka Gakkai's women's division, right? right? Which is behind basically all of, oh, all the- Soka Gakkai. Yeah, but no, no. The, the, <laughs> as I said, Stephen Reed and Axel Klein's book on Komeito is the really the only book that you ever have to read on Japanese politics. No. The one that they just wrote and they released last year completely changes your entire view of the way. Mm. But, but it's inside baseball <laughs> stuff. Okay. Uh, I want a good story and a narrative. Is there a good story or narrative? Well, listen, I, I really appreciate your your observation that this is too inside Don't baseball. Don't kill the messenger. Now, I'm, I'm not killing the messenger. In the message. No, I think it's I think it's a valid point. <laughs> and I think it's it's this conversation is relevant because it helps us figure out and understand why things are happening and also to predict what could be happening in the near term. I mean, well, I, I want to make two points. One is I'm a woman, and women uh, generally are not into a lot of the inside baseball, mm-hmm. sports-wise or politics-wise. That just goes without saying. Political science majors are still predominantly male. It's changing a little bit. But two, I'm known as a woman who's really into politics. So I'm I'm sort of kind of bolder about politics than even a lot of men I know. And if I'm disengaged from Mm -hmm. a political discussion, I'm just saying, how can we frame this to have more of a storyline? And once you started talking about some issues and some platforms there and the 
collective self-defense and the possibility Article 9 Changing, would be, right. yeah. That, I think, can resonate to more people mm -hmm. because they, they just, you hear the names floating around and they're just not gonna mean sure. as well, much to I people. I think with most political parties and political leaders, it is a kind of a cult yeah. uh, system. Mm. And uh, the older mm. you get, the more you collect favors and distribute mm -hmm. favors, you, you rise in power right. and, and you're elected over and over again and now you get a, a, a cabinet position and that sort of thing. But I think that's replicated also in the opposition parties. Mm. They are very definitely um, geared towards a charismatic leader. And that's what's, uh, you know, the danger with what's happening with Hashimoto and, and the election in, in Osaka. There are five main opposition uh, parties in Japan and this is changing now and that's why it's a burning issue for us today because the implications for that are really great when we start going towards the revision of the Constitution. You know, how many people are voting? They're changing the voting age from 20 to 18. That will be coming up in time for the, huh. uh, the upper house elections in 2016. Mm. So there's a lot going on. And yes, it does get a little bit tedious and boring. Mm. What can well, I say? Well, not when you said cult. But, uh, then, but so. okay, I'd like to wrap up with the concept that the reason why is that you, there has to be a party behind a leader. And right now, what we have is only one kind of leader. In, in, in the political uh, literature that I'm currently teaching at Sophia, there are two kinds of leaders, transformational leaders and transactional leaders. Transactional leaders are ones who make the political deals and they cobble together coalitions and you, do, you scratch my back, I scratch your back. And they're able to work out and create coalitions of mutual interest. Transformational leaders actually change the conditions. Mm -hmm. And Japan right now, Mr. Hashimoto was the transformational mm -hmm. leader. Mm -hmm. What's left are now transactional leaders. And they're interchangeable, really. Uh, Mr. Abe has- they're like is, Legos. <laughs> but the, Mr. Abe <laughs> basically <laughs> is a wheeler dealer. Mm -hmm. And we saw that this week when he went with his main rival within the party now, Mr. Nikai, and went to Nikai's home district and prayed at a, a, at a Buddhist temple, which I've never seen him do. I've only seen him go to Shinto with shrines. With a lot of press until, there, I'm sure. A lot of press. And they were smiling and talking about mutual interests and all this stuff. He has basically made deals with everybody. Mm -hmm. And he's a transactional leader par excellence. Mm -hmm. But for transformation of a country, you need people who are willing to change the status quo. Mm -hmm. And we lost that, right. or we're going to lose that in Mr. Hashimoto. Well, that story is not finished yet. I mean, it's the pages are still being written as we talk. Um, I think this is a, a really terrific conversation, a great discussion. Thank you for your insight. With that, I think I'd like to draw this conversation to a close. You've been watching Tokyo on Fire. Thank you very much. You can post your comments to us at comments at Tokyo on Fire. You can also visit us on our webpage, tokyoonfire.com. You can send us comments via Twitter at hashtag Tokyo on Fire. And you can post your comments directly to YouTube. Please tell your friends about Tokyo on Fire. Engage us in the discussion. Thank you very much for watching Tokyo on Fire. This is Timothy Langley. Look forward to seeing you next week.